Okay, hi everybody, thank you, thank you all for coming. And uh, first I just want to announce the dedications. Tonight's shear is dedicated in honor of the birthday of Devorah Shore by your husband Yaakov, all the way in California. And Yaakov sends a special tribute to his Eish Chayel. It is a gift from Hashem to be married to Devorah, a true Eish Chayel, who gives her time and energy, her heart and soul to everyone she meets. And may they have much, much bracha. Admeya v'yesrim v'yot. Refua Shlema to Chaim Shimon ben Elka and Chaim Shlema Mordechai ben Freidel. May they have a Refua Shlema b'soch shar chole Yisrael. And an Aliyat Neshama. Tonight's class has been also sponsored by Mark and Julia Weintraub of Vancouver and the Deloya family of Muncie in remembrance of daughter and sister Daniela Esther Bat Menachem Mendel Yeshayo Weintraub, as well as the mother and grandmother Arita Weintraub Pesha Rivka Bas Chaim Moshe Viester, whose yard sites fall out on 18 and 19 Sivan. Again, may the Divrei Taira be of the Ili Nishmasam, and as always, we are very appreciative of the Hachzakas Taira. Uh, today, uh, this parsha this week in Eretz Israel is the big, big parsha of the Meraglim, although there are many other interesting things in the parsha as well. But I want to go back a little bit. I want to go back to next, uh, last week, both because it'll be a Hakdama to the Meraglim, and because of our listeners in Chutz Laaretz, who will talk and be reading Parshas Balaischa in the coming week. I know whenever I do that, I actually get, I don't call it hate mail, but people say, you live in Eretz Israel, how dare you, you follow the Chutz Laaretz schedule. I do plan on talking about the Meraglim too, but I want to give you a little hakdama because it's actually a hakdama to the second half of Bamidbar Lagamri. The Pasuk says in Mishle, Shlomo HaMelech, the Chacham Mikhal Adam, says, Chachmais Nashim Bonsa Besa, the wisdom of women build a house. Again, appropriate to the birthday. Chatzva Amudeha Shiva, she digs, excavates seven columns for the house. So the Gemara has a drasha that uh, the woman is none other than the Taira Sashem, that's often called Eish Chayel, and the Chatzva Mudeha Shiva and the seven columns refers to the idea of the seven chumashim in the Taira. So the obvious question is, what do you mean seven? I thought it was five. The word chumash means one-fifth. How do you have seven chumashim? So the Gemara says, ah, because Sefer Bamidbor counts as three chumashim. So you have Breshish, Mais, Vayikra is three. Bamidbor is three, that's six. And Devarim is the seventh one. What are the three books of the book of Bamidbar? So it says, from the beginning of Bamidbar until they left Tarsinai, which was last week, is Chumash number one. Chumash number two is only two psukim. Two psukim. Vayib, which we say whenever we take out the Torah. Vayib and Sayah Arain, when the Arain traveled as they were leaving, so Maisha said, Kuma Hashem, arise Hashem, vecha, so your enemies will scatter. Uvenu chau yaymar, which we say when we put back the Torah, and when the Aaron came to, the, came to rest, Maisha was mispalel, shuva Hashem, riva vaysalfa Yisrael, return HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to the myriads of Am Yisrael, be mashre, rest your Shekhinah. Tu psukim. That's Chumash number two. Chumash number three is from the middle of Baloscha, after those two psukim, till the end of Bamidbar. So the Chaira, the question is, what type of, what type of Chumash is it to have just two Psukim? What's up is two Psukim? And why is Bamidbar divided into three? So Rav Tzadok Kinira is Mazber, a very, very interesting idea. He says, let's look at book one and book three, and then we'll go back to what book two is. Book one is the creation of the ideal world. HaKadosh Baruch Hu envisions an Am Yisrael which is surrounding the Mishkan. The Mishkan, which is service of God, is the focal point. But they're surrounding the Mishkan not simply as monolithic people doing the same thing, but with different Shvatim, different tribes, different Tigalim, different flags. 
That's a very important insight. I think we spoke about it a number of times. That the concept of Shvatim is that Avodah Sashem is not supposed to be monolithic. Yeah, we have a common denominator. Taira and mitzvahs. But within the framework of Taira and mitzvahs, Hashem wants there to be individuality and uniqueness and different to Rachim. That's why every Shevet had its own Mahalich, had its own approach in Avedah Hashem. So this is the ideal society, the society of people, all of whom look at the Mishkan, the Avodah Hashem, as the central core of their lives but they do so with diversity and uniqueness and individuality. And Rav Sarek goes on and says that even the three camps of the Levium represent the three fundamental principles that Pirkei Avos says, al shleisha devarim, the world exists with three pillars. Torah, the study of Torah, Avoda, divine service of prayer and, cor and sacrifice, and gemilas chasadim, and acts of loving kindness. So he says, kohas, who carries the Aron HaKodesh, represents the power of Torah learning, and that's why it's called Kodesh Kedoshim, the Holy of Holies. Uh, Gershon, who carried on the wagons, on wagons, because Kos carried it on the shoulder, Gershon carried it on the wagons, the cloths, the, the tapestries, and the, the wall hangings, since that forms the roof of the Mishkan, we find that the notion that a roof is what makes a building a bias. And we find that the term bias is connected to prayer, base tefillah. So Gershon represents the koach of tefillah. And Merari, that had physically the heaviest burden of carrying the real heavy stuff, and even though it was on wagons, but they had to load the wagons, that represents gemilus chesed, kindness, because the Gemara says in Sukkah, what is the difference between tzedakah and chesed, gemilus chesed? Tzedakah you do with your checkbook. Gemilus chesed you do with your physical exertion. So Rav Sadak is saying the first part of Bamidbar is painting the ideal world, the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants the Jewish people to exist, in which Avodah Hashem, the Mishkan, is their center. And around that is Torah, Avodah, Gemilus Chasadim. And around that, building on that, is the uniqueness of every Shevet. And even the halacha that says you must expel from the camp the mitzora and the Zav, the one with the Ganeriel discharge, and the Tamei Mace, without going over all the halachas there. Rav Sadok says, if the three subgroups of Levi represent Torah, Avodah, Gemilas, Chasadim, the Tameim represent the three negative forces that destroy the world. And Pirkei Avos says, Rabbi Lazar Kapor, Kina, jealousy, Taiva, lust for sensual and material pleasures, and Kavai, the need for ego uh, glorification. Might see in this Adam and Olam, they take a person out of this world, that means he loses Olam Abba, and even his life in Olam Azah is miserable. So Rav Sadok says, quite logically, the Mitzayra, whose primary sin is Lashon Hara, and Lashon Hara often comes from jealousy, right? I want to knock you down because I'm jealous of you. So Mitzayra represents the Kawach of Kina, the Zav, a sexually transmitted disease, that's taiva, too much taiva. And Tomei Mace is a little uh, more abstract, but Rav Tzedek argues that death came into the world because of the chait of Adam and Chava eating from the Eitz Adas. And Rav Tzedek says, what made them eat from the Eitz Adas was the Nochash's claim, the day you eat from it, you'll be like God. So. It's not like we think it was the, the smell of the fruit uh, or the taste of the fruit. It was the notion that this is, talk about the ultimate ego trip. Someone gives you a pill and says, take this pill, you'll be a Kaddish Baruch. Of course, it wasn't true. But the, the death came into the world because of covet. So Rav Sadok says, Shiluach Temeim. That means sending out the Temeim means banish from your society the negative factors of Kina, Taiva, and Kavad. Mitzayra, Zav, Tamemes. So, everything in the first part of my Midbar is essentially the ideal world. And even though it mentions some Averas like Sota, etc., but there too, 
It gives you a way to rectify it, a way to fix it, a way to be mesakin. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu understands that the world is not going to be perfect. So there have to be mechanisms for repentance and mechanisms for rectification. So we will look at Bamidbar as the, the first part of Bamidbar, as the ideal world. The third part of Bamidbar, starting from the middle of last week and continuing this week and the rest of the Sefer, is the sordid reality of life in which everything seems to fall apart. In fact, the negative kochot of kina taiva v'kavait reoccur over and over again. We started with taiva last week. They're not happy with the man. The man could taste like whatever they want. But they're not happy with it. They want meat. And in fact, it even says, hisavu tava, which literally means they lusted for lust. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that it wasn't even they wanted anything specific. They wanted to <coughs> indulge their taiva. It reminds me always, uh, Pepsi-Cola, I don't know if they still have it, they used to have a campaign, uh, an advertisement, that said, if you drink Pepsi, you can get prizes. So it says, drink Pepsi, get stuff. It doesn't even say what it is. Lamayin It doesn't make a difference what it is. I just want stuff. It doesn't even have to be anything. Just the idea of acquisition, acquisition, acquisition. So that's taiva. The maraglin, although there are many, many deeper meanings, but the, the Zohar HaKadosh says that part of why the maraglin sabotaged going to Eretz Yisrael is because they thought they would lose their jobs. They wanted the kavod of being a Nazi. And then next week we're going to read about Kairach, which of course is exemplary of jealousy. Korach was not just seeking kavod. Korach Badafka was jealous of what Aaron had, what Moshe had, etc. So everything's spinning out of control. It's like you create this ideal world and then it all falls apart. So Bamidbar Chelek 1 is the ideal of the Ratzon Hashem. Bamidbar Chelek 3 is the sordid reality of Nefila. Ah, so now we come to the enigmatic book 2, which is only two psukim. That represents the transition. How do you get from the glorious ideal to the sordid reality? How do you get, as the Gemara's Lashon, uh, from the Meigra Rama, from the high roof, the Bira Mixa, to the deep pit. How does that happen? Answer, because in those two psukim, and a little before as well, the Jewish people are finally given the signal that it's time to leave Harsinai and start journeying in the desert. Right? People don't realize they were in Harsinai almost a year. Matan Torah was, well, you know, well, they had the Egal, they had all that, but they came to Harsinai Rosh or Midbar Sinai, Rosh Chodesh Sivan, and they stayed there until the 23rd of year, Mamish almost, and then the Anan, the cloud of glory, started moving. It was time to move. So it mentions, Vayisu Mehar Hashem, when they traveled from the mountain of God, they did so with a great deal of enthusiasm. And the expression that's used is, Ketinaik. <laughs> like a child running away from school, let's say when it's summer vacation or whatever it is, because they were worried. They said, listen, we got 613 mitzvahs or whatever mitzvahs they got at that point. Truth is, a lot of mitzvahs they were given later. But we got a lot of mitzvahs. He says, the longer we stay here, the more mitzvahs will give us. Baruch Hashem, we can get out of here. And of course, it didn't work because Lamai said they got mitzvahs. I mean, Moshe got the mitzvahs for Sinai, but Bnei Yisrael got it over the 40 years. But they thought, let's get out of here. We don't, uh, we're not going to get mitzvahs. So what is mashchis, what destroys the beautiful potential of Kirvas Elokim, is the attitude. The attitude that this is a burden for us. We want to get out of here. Now, let's take a little further. Those two psukim, Vayib and Soha Aren have a very unusual bracketing in the Sefer Torah itself. There's a nun, that's a backwards nun, uh, either upside down or backwards or both, it's a machlokas, but upside down and turned over. That's before Vayib and Soha Aren, and an inverted backwards nun afterwards. We don't read it, there's nothing to read. 
But a Sefer Torah has to be written. Halacha l'moshem Sinai, a Sefer Torah has to be written with the Nun Hafucha. What's the significance? So Rav Sadak says very Pasha. We find that the letter Nun is often symbolic of Nefila, falling down. The most famous source is, of course, Rav Yechanan's statement in Maseches Brachos. Ashrei, well, actually it's not Ashrei, it's Tehila Ludavid. Ashrei. The, uh, the Pasuk of Ashrei is actually from another capital of Tehillim. But, um, but Tehila Ludavid, which is Kuf Mem He. Right? We say it three times a day. So Tehila Ludavid is Aleph base. Each verse begins with the letter of the Aleph base. But there's no verse that begins with Nun. Malchuscha, Malchus, Kalol Lamim. And the next one is Somei Hashem. Right? So it skips from Mem to Samach. There's no Nun in the beginning of Ashrei. So says Rabbi Yechanan, why is there no Nun in Ashrei? Because Nun represents falling and failure and defeat. As the Navi Amai said, describing Am Yisrael Begalos, Nafla, she has fallen. Laisaisif comes, she will not be able to get up. David Amelech did not want to begin a pasuk with nefila, and therefore, although he mentions the word nefila, or uh, but only in the next one, Seimei Hashem, Hashem supports those who fall. So nefila is okay if you have Hashem supporting you, but not so. Now the emesis, that's a well-known Gemara. The Gemara actually is very, very difficult because the emesis. Ashrei is not the only alphabetical acrostic in Tehillim. There are a lot of alphabetical acrostics. And in many of the, the other, all the other alphabetical acrostics, Itaka says Anun. So, David HaMelech, and even if it's not an alphabetical acrostic, there are kind of a kind of psukim in Tehillim that begin with Anun. So, it's a bit of, you know, you have to be my and you have to uh, think about this, like what is it about Ashrei Bedavka or Tehillah the David, Kuf Mem Hei, 145, that David HaMelech is makbid not to have nefila. But putting that question aside, if the nun is a remez of nefila, the reason why you have the two nuns is because the tinai kabayreach, the child, the attitude of tinai kabayreach meisif is going to be, is going to cause a gavaldig and nefila, a tremendous downfall, as we see in the transition from book one to book three. Ah. But why is it reversed? Because the Torah is telling you, no matter how far you fall, you can always change the situation. There is no such thing as a nefila that is permanent, irreversible, irrevocable. And bedafka, the, the nun gets inverted, in the Psukim that talk about Vayhi bin Soa Ha'ara, not the Pasuk of them leaving, but the Aaron leaving, to remind you that if you grab on to the Koach of the Torah, the Nefila that occurs is a changeable Nefila. Okay, and that's a very, very important rule. In fact, Rav Tzadok talks about this, I mean, really, all, all Sufri Chasidus talk about it, but one of Rav Tzadok's big, big themes that he talks about over and over again, similar, although in a very different way, uh, to Rav Nachman, to, to the Breslover, that a person cannot be miyayish, a person cannot give up, a person has to understand that there's always going to be a chance. In fact, to go back to another thing from last week, I hope I don't get overly criticized for this, this is ultimately the lesson of Pesach Sheni. People were tame, they were far away, uh, well, the, they go to Maishu Rabbeinu. So why should we be deprived? Maishu Rabbeinu asks Hashem. And the lekach, the lesson of Pesach Sheni is, no matter how impure you think you are, no matter how far you think you are from Hashem, there is the gift of the second chance. A person cannot be miyayesh. To give up is <coughs> the greatest. In fact, the, the Alter Rebbe has uh, in the Tanya, uh, has uh, the, uh, the third chilek of Tanya, Igeris HaTshuva, the, the letter he wrote about Tshuva. He talks about the fact that the Abishter forgives, 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 as long as you're sincere. In other words, even the Gemara that says, if a person says, I'm going to sin, because I know I'll do Tshuva, so it says he won't be forgiven, that means a person doesn't really regret what he did. He says, I'm doing it, I'll, I'll get Tshuva. But if a person really, really, really sincerely 
regrets what he does, Hashem will forgive it a million times. In fact, they say, I don't think this is any Gerasa I don't remember seeing it, but they say of Boyd Pashem, the Alter Rebbe, people ask the Kasha, you know, we dive in a whole day on Yom Kippur. We finish Ne'ilah. After Ne'ilah, we go straight to weekday Ma'ariv. Nobody broke the fast yet. And weekday Ma'ariv, the men are still wearing the kittles. So in the Amida, we say, Forgive us, forgive us. What did we do wrong? We had Yom Kippur. So some say the kavana that people have in Ma'ariv after Ne'ilah is, is so, such a weak kavana because I'm hungry and I want to get home that maybe I'm asking him, forgive me for this davening already. But I think the, 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 the altar, they say the same, the altar Rebbe. I, I don't know where it is. That if a person leaves Yom Kippur and feels that they were too sinful to be forgiven, that's the biggest chait. It's a chait that you're not believing in the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu forgave you. And for that, you've got to do tshuva after Yom Kippur if a person doesn't feel, right? So this is an important idea. Uh, so again, book one of Bamidbar is the ideal. And book three of Bamidbar is the failure. And the transition is the two psukim, which represents Vayisu leaving Har Hashem. And that's Nefila. But the Nefila is reversible when you connect yourself, Vayhi bin Saya, Ha'aron, that the cook, holding on to the Torah will elevate me. In fact, they say, um, uh, they say that this idea that in Mitzrayim, the famous idea of the Arizal, that in Mitzrayim the Jews were on the 49th level of Tumah. That's the one-fifth that, that survived. And if we would have stayed even a minute that it takes, a few minutes to, for the dough to rise, we would have hit level 50. And that's why it says, Lo uh, we couldn't wait. It wasn't only because Paro was kicking us out. We had to leave because we would have hit Sharnun, whatever that even means. So it's brought down in Svarim that the notion that once you hit the 50th gate, you're irredeemable, was only before the Torah was given. Once the Torah was given, the Torah can save you even from the 50th level. And they darshan, they darshan, B'derech Drush, uh, Rabbi Akiva. This is uh, often a song that we sing on Simchas Torah, but Rabbi Akiva at the end of Maseches Yuma describes Ashrechem Yisrael, how happy to the Jewish people be, how fortunate. It says, Lifne me atem mitaharim. In front of whom do you get purified? Umi mitahar eschem. And who purifies you? And the answer is, Avi avichem shabashamayim Hashem. Right, so that's it. So the Chassam Seifer says, B'derech drush. Lifne me. Me, Mem Yud, is begamatri of 50. Lifne me. When you're not yet at the 50th level, you have the power to purify yourself. Umi, when you've hit 50, Hashem will purify you through the Kayach of the Torah. Meaning even Bashar Nun, there's the Kayach. Because otherwise, otherwise it's just a, a rhetorical repetition. Who is going to be right? Lift me, Atemitarim, Umi Mitarim Eschem. Okay. So once again, a person should never, should never be, be miyayish. Okay. So now, let's talk a little bit about the Meraglim themselves. Uh, first of all, there's an interesting Machlokas Rishayim. Uh, was it an Avera on the part of Klal Yisrael to send Meraglim? Meaning, what is the Avera exactly? Was Shiluach a Meraglim, appointing 12 people to spy out the land? Was that an Avera? So there seems to be a machlokas, Rashi and the Ramban. Because Rashi says, Rashi has a stira, uh, as a contradiction. In Parsha Shalach, Hashem seems to say, Shalach Lecha, send Meraglim. If I just read the Chomish, I would say Hashem is commanding, send Meraglim. And yet we read in Parsha Stuvarim that the people came to Meish Rabbeinu and they said, Mishlacha Anashim. So, did Shiluach Meraglim come from Hashem? Or did it come from the people? So Rashi's approach was, it came from the people. The people didn't have a Muna. The actual asking for Meraglim meant they weren't totally confident in God's promise. And when Hashem said, Shalach Lecha, he was not saying a mitzvah. He was saying, 
I think it's not a good idea, but if you want to do it, do it. So according to Rashi, I'll come back to this, the actual sending of the Maraglim showed a lack of emuna. Ramban is very much chaylik on Rashi. Ramban says, sending Maraglim is not inconsistent with a divine promise. Yes, Hashem promised them Eretz Yisrael, but they're mechoyev to engage in reasonable planning. They have to have an army, even though Hashem will fight for them. And part of preparing for battle is to know the strong points, the weak points. And the Ramban brings two beautiful rayas, two beautiful proofs that there's nothing wrong with Shiluch Meraglim. After the whole Misa of the Meraglim, where the Jewish people are condemned to wander in the desert for 40 years, at some point, Avery Yardin, east of the Yardin, Moshe sends Meraglim to Meraglim, the Ragel at Yazer, to check out a town called Yazer, which they conquered. Moshe Rabbeinu sent out Meraglim after the Chet HaMeraglim. So obviously, there's nothing wrong with military planning. Moreover, later, in the book of Yoshua, when they've already crossed the Yardin, Yoshua bin Nun, and of course he, more than anybody, <laughs> knows about the Chet HaMeraglim, he sends Meraglim to Yericho. He sends Kali for you to Yericho. So the Ramban actually learns there is nothing wrong with sending Meraglim. It is a legitimate military preparation for battle. And even when Hashem promises you victory, you are mechuyav to do your part in responsible planning. The Chet was not the shiluach of the Meraglim. The chait was, uh, number one, the way the Meraglim reported it and the way the Jewish people reacted with a lack of emuna. That was the chait. But sending Meraglim to give you an objective report of what's a good place to attack, etc., is perfectly legitimate. Now the Emma says, the Nitziv, in his Perish Hamik Davar, gives a beautiful reconciliation in which he points out that both Rashi and the Ramban are both correct at the same time. As we say, Elu vi Elu, Divri Elu Kim Chaim, they're both correct. Because he says like this, he, he develops the aside that it may have been a sin to need this, but once you need it, it becomes a mitzvah. In other words, he, he analyzes this in terms of melech. Uh, there is a mitzvah in the Torah to have a king. So one of the famous questions is, if there's a mitzvah in the Torah for the Jewish people to have a king, so why, when the Jewish people ask Shmuel to appoint a king, does Shmuel give them all sorts of musr, that Hashem is your king, why do you want a flesh and blood king? It's sinful. How could it be sinful? The Torah says there's a mitzvah to have a king. So says the Nitzv, in an ideal world, where your emunah in Hashem is very, very strong, you don't need human rulers. But if you ask for it, that which you shouldn't have asked for becomes a chiv once you ask for it. Because once you show your amuna is not on that highest level, so Hashem, in other words, the idea is that the less amuna, the less bitachin I have in Hashem, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more I have to work within the world of teva, the world of nature, the greater the amuna, the less the hishtadlis. The lesser of amuna, the more of the hishtadlis. Therefore, it was sinful to ask for a king. But once they ask, it becomes obligatory. Mm -hmm. And the Nisiv brings a riot to this idea from Shmuel Anavi himself, an amazing thing. Hashem tells Shmuel Anavi, after Hashem decided to depose Shaul HaMelech, I'm just take this. So he tells Shmuel, go to Yishai in Beis Lechem and anoint one of his sons to be king. 
So what does Shmuel say? So Shmuel says, Eich Eilech, how can I go? The Shama Shal, Shal will hear that I'm going and anointing another king. He's going to kill me. How can I go? So Hashem said, ah, the way it's going to work is that this time you're allowed to bring korbanos. There's no base on Mikdash yet. You're allowed to bring korbanos on bamos, private altars. So when you go to Beis Lechem, say you're just bringing a korban shmuel, but anyway, his style was he would travel around different cities and he would bring korbanos. So Shoal is not going to think you're going to anoint a king. So the Nisib asked the Kasha, why does Hashem only give him this piece of advice when he asks? Hashem should have told him, go to Beis Lechem and bring a korban. Hashem didn't say that. Hashem, go to Beis Lechem and anoint uh, Yishai's sons. Only when Shmuel asks, but I'm afraid for my life, does Hashem says, okay, you got to do something. So says the Nitziv, exactly this you say. Again, it's hard for us to understand because Shmuel was such a great, great tzaddik, but at least at this particular juncture, the bitachon was not at the highest level. If Shmuel wouldn't have been afraid, he could go and he could even make a public thing and nothing would happen to him. But once he reveals to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that he's afraid. However we understand that, Hashem says, ah, now we got to work within nature. Within nature, so you'll make a strategy where Shoal is not going to get it. So says the Nitzev, that's how we understand Shmuel. And that's how we understand the mitzvah of appointing a king, even though it was an Avera to ask for a king. And says the Nitzev, that is how we understand Meraglim. Rashi is correct. This is a generation that saw the Makos, that saw the splitting of the Red Sea, uh, that every day gets the man coming down Mina Shamayim, that has clouds of glory. They should have known Hashem will protect them. Why are they asking for military strategies? And that's why Rashi says asking for the Meraglim was a chay. But once they show that they're afraid, they're worried, it now becomes a chiv. And that's why Moshe later sent Meraglim, because based on their situation, it was a chiv. And that's why Yoshua sent Meraglim, because the Jewish people were not holding on that madrega. So the Nitziv is a very interesting peshara, a very interesting compromise position between Rashi and Ramban, Right, Ramban says there was no sin in sending Meraglim. Rashi says there was a sin. So the Nitziv says there was a sin to ask for it. But once they ask for it, it becomes a chiv. It now becomes your measure of hishtadlas, your measure of having to work within the world. Because if you don't accept emuna on a 100% basis, HaKadosh Baruch Hu deals with you within the, more within the boundaries of nature. It's a very interesting very interesting you said. Okay. But now, let's go to the actual Avera, not the sending of the Miraglim, but the Miraglim were sent. They were gone for 40 days. They come back on the 8th of Av, and they recount their story that day, and that night, the night of Tisha B'Av, so it says, all the men cried and sobbed. We'll talk about the women. And that is why Tishua became the day of tragedy. Uh, Hashem said, Atem b'chisem, shel chinam. You have cried a weeping for no reason. This day will be the b'chia l'dayrais, the crying forever and ever. And the question is, how do we understand this chait? And it's really a two questions. Uh, how do you understand the miraglim themselves? Maishu Rabbeinu chose people. Kulam Anashim, all of them were men of distinction. They were tzaddik and be'aisasha. They were righteous people. They were great people. Unless you go with the Zohar, that they, even that's really difficult. They were worried they would lose their jobs. Like, what exactly was the pacha? So, number one, how could they come back with a report that just puts fear in the hearts of everybody? And the Kach is also on B'nai Yisrael. How could they cry? How could they not believe? I mean, the truth is, all of us have to believe all the time, but, but especially that generation. That generation saw everything. All of a sudden, they're not going to believe what's going on. 
So there's a Mahalik that uh, a lot of Svarim say in different words, uh, whether it's Rav Hirsch, uh, the Svasemes, I mean, the, all, all the different Svarim go with this Mahalik, uh, many Chabad to the Rebbeim go with this as well, that the Miraglim's Kavana was a very elevated Kavana. It was a Kavana L'Shem Shemayim. And they basically know, knew that the way Hashem will deal with them in Eretz Yisrael is very different than the way Hashem deals with them in the Midbar. In the Midbar, they are in a spiritual cocoon where they see godliness open and explicit. They see miracles every single day. The man falls min ha-shamayim. And remember, the whole nefila of the man was also very miraculous. Number one, it could taste like whatever you wanted it to taste like, except the onions or whatever. But with Derek Lau, you wanted steak, you got steak, or whatever it is. Number two, the man fell. Each person, according to his, it was like a daily report card from Hashem. If you were righteous, your man fell right next to you. If you weren't so righteous, you had to look around until you found it. I once heard a Rosh Yeshiva compare this to uh, Yeshiva boys who go out to restaurants. He says, if you're at Sadiq, you eat the Yeshiva food. Right there. If not, you've got to look around for something to eat. Right? It's a similar, similar type, of, type of idea. So people ask a question, wait a second. Let's assume I'm not so great and you're a great Sadiq and your man is right near your tent, so why don't I take your man if I get up early enough? The answer is, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. That's the nature of the man itself. You saw where your man was, and I didn't see where your man was. I only saw my man. So I'm walking and walking and looking and looking, and finally I'll, I'll see something. Right? It's an amazing thing. So the man was a miracle. The clouds of glory were a miracle. The bear, the, the Miriam's well, was a miracle. So all of a sudden they don't believe. But in the Midbar, the Yad Hashem was open was Galoi. Once they come to Eretz Yisrael, there's going to be a different type of relationship with Hashem. Yes, there'll still be Hashgacha, God's providence will be there, in fact, in Eretz Yisrael, much more than Chutz Laretz generally. But it's, there's going to be a tremendous amount of concealment of the divine. You're not going to get man, you're going to have to plow and plant and harvest and thresh. You're going to have to have armies. You're going to have to build cities. You're going to have to have lawyers and accountants and doctors. In other words, it'll be a world where our Kaddish Baruch Hu is still running it. But Hashem will be much more concealed. Derech HaTeva. So the Miraglim have a tremendous pachat for all of Klal Yisrael. We, in the Midbar, we see HaKadosh Baruch Hu every single minute. But there, we're not going to see the Yad Hashem. Now, if you're not going to see the Yad Hashem, one of two possible things will happen. Either you will have the arrogance, the gaiva, of attributing your successes to your own abilities, which indeed the Torah warns us many times, where a person will say, Kochi v'yotzim yadi, it is my power that achieved all of this. That's one way I could go. Or the other way I could go is, I could be tzibrochen, I could be broken, I could feel abandoned. I could feel, Hayesh Hashem b'kirbenu, is Hashem with us? So, the Meraglim are afraid of life in Eretz Yisrael. They're afraid that B'nai Yisrael will not be able to sustain a madrega of emuno bitochen in a world where God's presence is hidden and concealed. And let me just add something to this. It was already known that Moshe Rabbeinu, even though Moshe didn't commit his sin of hitting the rock yet, but it was already known that Moshe would die before they enter Eretz Yisrael. We know this because when it mentions in last week's Parsha, Eldad and Medad were giving prophecies and Yoshua says to Moshe, arrest them, put them in jail. So Rashi says, what is Yoshua getting so upset about? Because Eldad and Medad were saying, Moshe Mace, 
Moshe will die and Yehoshua will bring them into Eretz Yisrael. So you see the Anava of Yehoshua. Yehoshua, you, know, you might think if you're a Mike Pence or something, uh, you know, you might be happy. Someone's saying, oh, Trump is out of the race. So, so Mike Pence, it's the other way around. Yehoshua doesn't want to be leader. Yehoshua would rather have Major <coughs> Avain as leader. So imagine this from the perspective of the Miraglim. We're going to go into a different type of existence where HaKadosh Baruch is going to be concealed. We're going to lose a Meisher Rabbeinu. So the Cheshpen is, let's stay in the Midbar a little longer. It's like, I'll give you a, a, a simple dimyon. Uh, in fact, this, the, the, these are questions people face every day. A guy is learning in Kailal, a guy is learning Torah full time, Steigen, growing in Torah learning. But there comes a time that he has to support his family. So he has to enter the working world. But he's so scared of entering that working world. The Torah is not going to be intense. There will be secular and negative influences. People will be dishonest. So a person might say, I need more time in Kailo. Maybe I'll squeeze another year, another six months. It'll build me up. It'll give me reserves. So the Miraculum are actually saying, to the B'nai Yisrael. You're going to be facing enemies and challenges. You know, we're not on that Madrega yet. We need more time. We need more time with the Mun. We need more time with Moshe Rabbeinu. We need more time to internalize the Hashgacha, the providence of God, so that when we come to Eretz Yisrael, we will have such a vivid memory of that that we will see the mun even in the regular grain that we planted and grew. So seen in this way, the gezerah that the generation would wander in the desert for 40 years was not necessarily totally a punishment. It was exactly what they wanted. They got Moshe Rabbeinu for 39 more years. They got the mun for all of those extra years. Yeah, now of course they died, I mean that generation died and didn't enter, but they actually got the experiment that they wanted. Now, so number one, the, the problem is Hester Panim, right, the concealment of the divine, and number two, that in Eretz Yisrael they're gonna have to be involved in the Gashmias of the world, the physicality of the world, the materialism of the world. And as we mentioned last week, they felt there would be greater Kedusha if we keep away from this. Right, so this is a general Mahalech of the Chet HaMaraglim. And this explains a very, very interesting, interesting thing. We know that Moshe Rabbeinu did have a sense that things would not turn out well. So he was mispalel for Yehoshua that Yehoshua should not be dragged down by the Chet HaMaraglim. And that's why Yehoshua's name, his original name was Hoshea. But Moshe added the Yud, so the Yud and the He is the name of Hashem. Ka Yeshiacha. May God save you. Miatsas HaMaraglim. From the evil counsel of the Maraglim. Now we know that there were two Maraglim that remained righteous, Yehoshua and Kalev. So why does Moshe Rabbeinu only pray for Yehoshua and Moshe doesn't pray for Kalev? Now, let me give you another interesting observation. When the Miraglim give their report about how bad it is, we're not going to be able to defeat the enemy. So Yehoshua and Kalev fall on their faces Indeed. But the only one that speaks up is Kalev. Yehoshua is strangely very silent. Very, very silent. So there are two causes about Yehoshua. Number one, why is Moshe Mispalel for Yehoshua, not Kalev? Number two, why is it Kalev that protests and Yehoshua not? The answer is, both kashas have the same answer. If the Lashon Hara of the Miraglim is, 
without Moshe, we're not worthy to experience a world of physicality and materialism and Hester Panim. Who is the most likely to feel that inadequacy and that chisaran? That's Yoshua. Yoshua had to fill the biggest shoes in history. Yoshua was the replacement for the greatest Navi, whoever was and will ever be. Yoshua especially is prone to the insecurity of taking on this task. So Moshe Rabbeinu is margish. If the Meraglim are going to make the argument that without Moshe in the world of physicality and Hester, concealment, you will not be able to navigate it, it's going to affect Yehoshua more than anybody else. That's why Yehoshua needed the strengthening. And even with Moshe's tf uh, Rabbeinu's tefillah, Yehoshua had on some level, a moment of weakness where he, he, he was not able to rebut the taina of the Meraglim. The taina of the Meraglim was without Moshe, we're nothing. Yehoshua couldn't speak up that moment. Kalev had to do it. Right? This is uh, all of a getter. So, as is always the case, you know, whenever you, you explain something, by taking what is a chait and showing there were such high, elevated kavanos. <laughs> so now you have a question. So what's the sin? Right? What is the Aveira? Uh, if the Meraglim is such a legitimate cheshman, we need to be in Kailal much longer. We need to be in the Mon environment. We need to have Major Rabbeinu. So the answer is, Pashat, as is always the case, a person can have many, many calculations. But if Hashem gives you a job and Hashem gives you a mission, you have to believe that He will give you the ability to achieve that mission one way or the other. So part of the chait of the Meraglim was not only a lack of emuna in Hashem, but a lack of emuna in themselves. Belief you will have the power to do what you need to do, even without a Maishu Rabbeinu. Believe it, because I wouldn't give you the mission if I didn't give you the kochos, the power, the tools. And indeed, this ties into a very famous part from the Kutzker Rebbe, the enigmatic Kutzker. When the uh, Muraglim describe the very fearsome giants that they encountered, so they described them, We were in our own eyes as if we were grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes. So says the Kutzker Rebbe, it starts with you. You look at yourself as a grasshopper. You look at yourself as a nothing. You look at yourself as a person without abilities. That's how you will be perceived. But lehepech, and we talked about this uh, last week, I think, also. Of course, of course, a person has to be humble. A person has to be modest. But a person cannot use this as an excuse. A person can't say, oh, I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing. That's a Yetzir Hara. Because then a person says, I'm not capable of anything. So why would Hashem care about my mitzvahs, my learning? You know, I'm, I'm a nobody. The answer is, you're not a nobody. You're a somebody. Uh, Bishvili, that, those are the two pockets, right? In one pocket, Anochi Afar V'Efer, Rav Bunim of Peshischa said, I am dust and ashes. But in the other pocket, Bishvili Nivra Olam, because of me the world was created. Hashem made many cows and dogs and, and goats and, and, and cats. Only one man, one woman. So each person has to feel this whole universe is because of me. I could change and benefit and elevate and transform everything for good or for bad. Bishvili nivra ha'olam. Right, so that's the notion of the chet ha'maraglim. So again, a lot of different themes converge here. Number one, have faith in yourself. Number two, know that if Hashem gave you a task, you'll be able to complete it.
Number three, don't be afraid of your confrontation with the physical world. That through Torah you could sanctify the physical and material. Don't think your connection to Hashem is only when it's totally spiritual, like in the Midbar. But even when you are involved in the material world, you can sanctify and elevate. And uh, that's kind of what the uh, story of the Miraglim teach us. Uh, one other Nakuda about the Miraglim uh, that, that I want to mention is an interesting Ha'ara of the Ramban. You know, Maishu Rabbeinu no, uh, is mispalel that Hashem shouldn't destroy everybody right away. Forty years is Rachamim. Hashem spread it over a long time. So Maishu Rabbeinu uh, uses the familiar theme of Chilul Hashem, that if you destroy the Jews in the desert, the Goyim will say, you did not have the power to take them into Eretz Canaan and defeat the Canaanites, so you killed them off, so you wouldn't be defeated by them coming to Eretz Canaan. This is uh, normally described as the Chilul Hashem argument, uh, the desecration of God. Lama Yomru HaGoyim, why will the Goyim say? Now, the Emes is, by the Chet Egel, by the sin of the golden calf, Moshe had two arguments. He made the same argument, if you kill them in the desert, uh, people will say you didn't have the power, okay? But he made another argument, Zachor, remember the covenant, remember the promise you made with Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. You promised you would give the, their, their children Eretz Yisrael. How can you abrogate your covenant? So this is called bris avais, the covenant of the avais. So the Ramban points out, by the chedo ego, Moshe Rabbeinu used both chilul Hashem, lama yom ragayim, and bris avais. By the Maraglin, he only uses chilul Hashem. He doesn't use bris avais. Like, why doesn't he mention by the Maraglin, remember what you said to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So says the Ramban, a very interesting thing. You can only invoke the Avais if you live a life that is consistent with what the Avais believed in. It's like Lamashal, the famous old uh, joke about the definition of chutzpah is the person who kills his parents and then asks mercy from the court because he kill, he's now an orphan. By the way, this is an old joke that's at least a like hundred years old, but Lamaisa, in recent trials, some kids have actually made that argument. They said, hey, you know, they killed their parents and we're all alone in the world. Right? So, so the chutzpah of them actually happens. But the idea is, how can you say, what, I should have rachim that you're an orphan? You killed, but you didn't even care about your parents. So the same thing. If I ask Hashem, remember Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, but I reputed everything Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov stood for? I can't come to Hashem and say, remember the other. So, the Ramban says, although the ego was, of course, a tremendous Avera, it was not a repudiation of the others, because the others were mamin and Hashem, and making the ego, we also believed in Hashem, but we thought we needed an intermediary. So it was a mistake, but it was not a kafira, it was not a denial of God. So therefore, Moshe could still bring up the merit of the Avais. But by the Miraglim, where they showed that they didn't uh, believe uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the gift of Eretz Yisrael, since the Avais had such a love of Eretz Yisrael, when you repudiate what is a central Yisod of the Avais, you are no longer in a position to invoke Zechus Avais. This is what the Ramban says, and that's why Maitre Rabbeinu only used the Chilul Hashem argument of Lama Yaimru HaGoyim, he did not invoke the argument of uh, Zechus or Bris Avais. They're actually not the same, but right now we're not going to do it. Zechus Avais is the merit of the Avais. Bris Avais is the promise of the Avais. So technically they are different concepts. Uh, the Gemara says Zechus Avais, the merit could run out, but there's still a covenant. Okay. So I just want to end with a very, very a sh a short thought. And that is, it is Yadua that although the entire generation, anyone that was 20 years old at the time of the Exodus, died in the desert, but we are told that the Gezerah was not made on the women. Just as the women did not sin 
with the golden calf. The women did not sin with the chait hamaraglim. And this is illustrative of the notion that their level of both emuna and the love of Eretz Yisrael was greater than the men. In fact, that's why Beno Slavchad also had great love for Eretz Yisrael. So I just want to explain that based on the idea that we mentioned tonight, that part of the fear of the Miraglim was confrontation with a material world would take them away from God. You see that women are actually better able to deal with the world of materialism. There's an interesting morale. This is a famous Gemara that uh, anyone that's either been to a Sheva Brachas or had a Sheva Brachas, you know, knows this Gemara, that we have Ish isha, man and woman. So the Ish has a Yud, and the Isha has the He. Yud and He is God's name. So it says, oh, if there's God in the marriage, man is man, woman is woman, everything is good. Take Hashem out of the marriage. It becomes a destroying fire. Each one will destroy the other one. My famous, famous Gemara in Yavamas that is recited, uh, well, uh, not, it's not recited every Sheva Brachas, but for, it, it, within a week of Sheva Brachas, it's, it's uh, almost 100% certainty that it's going to be said probably more than once. So all of this is good, but the question the Maharal asks is, why does the man get the Yud of Hashem's name? and the woman get the hay of Hashem's name. Right? Yeah, it's the name of Hashem, but the man gets the yod, the woman gets the hay. So Maral says, the Gemara in Menachos tells us that yod represents olam haba, the world of spirituality. Because yod is the least material of any letter because it's the smallest. So yod represents ruchnius, spirituality. Now hay he says, is a composite of a Dalit and a Vav. Uh, visualize a hay. I'm, I'm sorry, Dalit and a Yud. He's, I, I say, Dalit and a Yud, that's what he says. Now, Dalit represents pure materialism. Because we talk about the four directions or even the four dimensions of matter. Length, width, height, and time. I mean, it wasn't only Einstein that said time is a dimension of matter. Chazal themselves say it. So Dalit, so if Yud is pure Ruchnius, Dalit is physicality. And if a He is a Yud in a Dalit, it's the ability to sanctify and elevate the physical. So the Morel says, men are not so good in that. Because a man becomes mekolko when he's involved in the physical world. You get uh, testosterone, you get competitiveness. Uh, you know, so, so we need a base medrash. I need to get away from that rat race. I need to go to shul. I need to go to the base medrash. Because when I touch olam hazeh, I get dragged down. So, a man kind of serves Hashem primarily through the Yud. A woman's unique koach is that she could take the Yud, spirituality, and bring it into the physical. Now, what's interesting is the spirituality within physicality will often be less intense because when you're simply sitting and learning and you're totally away from the world, you're nirvana, right? You can reach high madregas. When you have to change diapers or, or, or whatever it is, it's, it's harder to have the intensity of feeling. So you go from a, from a, from a yud to a hay. But ultimately, that's the higher, highest madrega. So based on the morale, I'm just, I'm just being most of, I'm just adding a para, that that might explain why women had less of a problem than men. Because if the men are afraid that in the world of physicality we're going to be dragged down. It's precisely the women who understood that you can bring the Yud even into the Dalit to make the hay, and therefore they would be able to confront the physicality. So um, Nashim did not sin with the ego. They did not sin with the Miraglim. Also, there is uh, Makairas that Shevet Levi. Actually, well, it's not clear from the Chumash, but there is Makairas that all of Shevet Levi uh, we're not nichlau 
in the Gezerah of the Meraglim. Of course, there was no spy from Shevet Levi, but even as a tribe, uh, they were not Nichshel. And I should say, maybe I'll save this for another talk, there was at least one Shita in Taisvis. You know, if you take 600,000 men that had to die over 40 years, so on an average, on an average, it's 15,000 a year. So according to uh, some Shittas and Taisvis, the very last year, the 40th year, Hashem gave a freebie and the last 15,000 did not die. Now it's very, very schwer because the Torah says there was no survivors other than Yeshua and Kalev. Now you're adding uh, another 15,000 people. But there is such a Shittas and Taisvis and Masechus Taina. So there may be more survivors uh, than we thought, but at least Mitzad the Nashim, I would suggest it was because they're better able to deal with the integration of materialism and spirituality. Okay, so I wish you all a wonderful Shabbos and uh, be well. Oh, it's your, 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 it's your,